All right, now, what I'm going to be preaching about this morning is, is a phrase that's, that's commonly used these days. It's, it's, a, it's a newer term where people talk about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I hear this a lot when we go out soul winning. Um, and, and I don't necessarily have a problem with it. Okay, it's not a problem with the phrase. There's nothing wrong with saying I have a relationship for, with Christ. Actually, I'm going to preach that it is very important to have a good relationship with Jesus Christ this morning. Unfortunately, though, I think this phrase gets tossed around a lot. And people will use it and say it like, oh, yeah, I've got a relationship with Jesus that really don't, or at least they don't have a really good relationship. They either don't have one at all or they don't have a good one, but they kind of throw it around because it's, it's the popular thing to say and it's kind of a catchphrase that's being used in a lot of churches these days. And so I'm going to be preaching on this personal relationship with Jesus. Now, that word alone, just that relationship, it's our relation to God or our relation to Jesus. And the very first thing in order to have this relationship with God is we need to be his child. We need to be born again. So in Matthew 18, if you look there, look at verse number three. The Bible says, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. We have to become, in order to go to heaven, in order to be with God, Right After we die, after we pass away, we need to be born again. We need to become as little children. That's where the relationship starts. We need to be saved. We need to be a child of God. That is where we could even begin to have a personal relationship. So when people say things like, well, I asked Jesus Christ into my heart to save me, you know, I don't have a problem with that if they, if they mean that they believed on Jesus Christ for their salvation. A lot of people will say that and that's what they mean. I try to use as much scriptural or biblical terminology as possible. Um, you know, the Bible talks about believing. It talks about faith as far as salvation goes. So if someone were to ask me, why am, why am I saved or why do I think I'm going to go to heaven when I die? It's because I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I use words and phrases. Now, Again, I, I'm not, it's not some horrible thing if someone says, I asked Jesus into my heart. Great. If, if, that, if you mean that you put your faith and trust on Christ to save you, that's fine. You know, I'd, but in order to avoid confusion, because some people will say that and they're still trusting in works and, they're, you know, and they think that they have to do all these other things to be saved. But um, this personal relationship, it starts with us being saved. And... Unfortunately, though, this phrase, a lot of people will use this as an excuse to skip out on church. People will use a phrase like that because they'll say, oh, hey, do you go to church anywhere? You know, and, and they'll, they'll like say, oh, well, I've got, a rela I've got a, my own relationship with God. I've got my own thing going on. You know, I don't need to go to some church. I don't need to, to, to hear what some man has to preach. I don't need any of this stuff. I've got my own relationship, and, and I'm good with that. And this is where I have a major problem with, with that type of an attitude. Because we're going to see what it takes to, to have a good relationship with God. You, you know, these people think they have such a great relationship with God, but that's really, they're just throwing out that as an excuse because they're too lazy or they're, they're, they like their sins too much or whatever it is to get off their rear and to actually get into a Bible-believing church. And they just want to throw that off so that they could feel good, so they could justify their sin of staying out of church. And yes, not going to church is a sin. We're going to get into that in a little bit. But they use it as an excuse. And, and oftentimes what I'll hear is people try to quote this verse. Look at verse 20 of Matthew 18, where it says, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So they say, see, I talk about Jesus with my friends. That's church. And they'll say, that's, that's just church because Jesus said, hey, where there's two or three gathered together, that's, that, there I am in the midst of them. And for one, they're kind of taking this out of context. And for two, they're not even understanding what this is saying. Now look, just because Jesus, I mean, Jesus is in your heart if you're saved, right? So Jesus is with you. If you're fellowshipping with other people, Jesus could be there. But that doesn't mean you're in church. And it doesn't mean that because this is stated that that means you don't have to go to church. And it also doesn't mean, you know, because people will try to think that, well, this is, if I'm just sitting down with a couple of people and, you know, I'm just sitting around with my buddies, that all of a sudden that's church. And it's not church. We're going to get a definition of that. But let's look at this in context here that they like to quote and use that. Look at verse number 15. We're going we're gonna to actually read this in context instead of just taking the one verse out and looking at it. 
Verse 15 reads, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. This is talking about, so in context, we're going to read the whole thing. He's saying if you have a problem with a brother in Christ, this is how you handle it. If you have a problem with someone, if they sin against you, if they trespass against you, you know what? You confront that person and deal with it. As you ought to. That's, that's the way you ought to deal with that one. Someone wrongs you, go to them first and try to solve the problem. And then he says, you know what? If that doesn't work, take one or two other people with you so that every word can be established so that there's no false accusations going on. Other people can hear. They can be witness. They can, they can hear everything that happens to, to put more accountability on, on both parties involved so that they speak the right things and no one's lying and, and bearing false witness. They could hear everything. And he says, now, if they're not going to hear after that, you bring a couple people, you're still trying to keep it low-key, then he says you bring it before the church. And then the church is going to decide and judge the matter and, and make a judgment one way or the other. And he says, and if he still doesn't even listen to the church, if the church judges against him, he's done wrong, he says, then you treat him as a heathen man. And, and he's out. And he's no longer going to be a part of the church. But let's read the actual verses here that explain that. We just read 15. Look at verse 16. He says, But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. Now notice, I want to point this out because verse 17 is talking about the church. Verse 20 is the one that says, Well, where there's two or three gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. But... There's a distinction here of saying you have to tell it unto the church. But if we, he neglect to hear the church, and look, just by context, if he says in verse 16, bring one or two more with you, well, now you have the two parties involved plus an extra one or two people. Isn't that two or three gathered together in his name? And he's saying... If they don't hear that, then bring it to the church. So just because you have a couple of people that are Christians, that are saved, that are, that are talking together or dealing with an issue or whatever it may be, that doesn't just mean that that's church. Okay, church is different. Church, church isn't just fellowshipping. When we go out, if we, we have dinner together, we go out and do something, or, or I go over to Brother Anderson's house, that's not church. We could be, we, Christ could be there, in the midst, and, and, you know, we're having godly conversation, we're talking, we could be talking about the Bible, but that doesn't make that church. Church is an assembling of the believers together in one place, and there's lots of things that go on at church, and we're going to get, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but let's keep reading here because he says in verse 17 that we need to tell it unto the church, but if you neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as an heathen man and a publican. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So we can see here, it says in verse 19 that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them. This is part of the power of prayer and going to God. And that's why he's saying where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. When, when you have, get a few people together and pray and ask God, hey, Jesus is in the midst and he's saying it shall be done for them. That's what this verse is talking about in context. This isn't saying that, oh, if you have two or three people gathered together, then that's church. Now, a church may be very small. There may only be a handful of people in a church. But we're going to see what a church is. We're going to see from the Bible that a church is literally a congregation. And turn, I want you to see this. I brought, I've, I've mentioned it in the past, but I want to make sure that I prove all things. So you don't just take my word for it. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. Flip to Hebrews chapter 2, and then also we're going to look at Psalm 22. We're going to be looking at a quote in the New Testament from Psalm 22, okay? And we're going to see, and this is a good way to study the Bible and to learn the Bible and understand what things mean, especially between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Um, when things are quoted and you notice maybe there's one or two words that are different, 
you can meet, you know, it's, it's a good indication that those words mean the exact same thing. And we're going to see that right here. So in Hebrews chapter 2, so you got a finger in Hebrews 2 and in Psalm 22, because we're going to go to both places real quick. Hebrews 2, look at verse 6, just to show you, because I'm not going to read the whole thing, but in context he says, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Verse 6, that was a quote from Psalm 8, 6, or Psalm 8, 4, excuse me. He's saying one in a certain place testified. He's talking about David, right? He testified, and it's written in Scripture, what is man that thou art mindful of? And then it goes on, and, and he continues, you know, with the chapter. But then in verse 11, he says, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, and this is a quote now, when he says, saying in verse 12, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, Will I sing praise unto thee? Now flip back to Psalm 22, 22 with that in mind. He said, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. Psalm 22, verse 22 says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. Exact same words. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. So we see here, he in the New Testament, they replaced the word congregation with church. And th these are really important to, to note these because God's teaching us what, what a lot of the meaning of words are. When, when you want to know what is a church, well, hey, the Bible definitely defines it here as a congregation. A church is where people group together, where you have believers that all come and join together at a specific time in a specific place. Now, does that place have to be some big building? No. Can it be a house? Yeah. Can it be outside under a tree? Sure. Can it be, you know, it could be anywhere, but it's a congregation. That's what a church is. It's not a specific building. It's not anything other than that. It's the congregation of believers, but it is a congregation and it happens at a set time. It's not just a couple of buddies hanging out. That's not church. I mean, it, it's a few believers. Sure, you could be talking about the Bible. Great. Church is something where you congregate together. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 10, because we're going to see now the importance of going to church. It's, it's a trendy thing. Now, and, and I hear this a lot. And, and the reason why I know of these things is because I talk to people every week. And, and I, I notice a pattern and these things are, are taught either in churches or online or some. I don't know where this is all stemming from. And I don't know how long necessarily it's been going on. It's been going on for a while. But this attitude of people saying, well, I don't need church. I don't need to go to church. I've got Christ and I've got God and I've got my relationship with him and I'm just fine right here. I don't need church. But going to church today is even more important than it ever has been. Ever. Going to church today is, is more important and we need more church now than we ever have. Look at Hebrews 10 verse 24. Hebrews 10 24 says, And let us consider one another. He's talking about saved people. Let's, let's consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. He's saying we need to provoke each other unto love, unto good works. Hey, we need to encourage each other. We need to be here for each other. Verse 25 not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. So apparently this has been going on for a very long time of people forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, meaning they reject it. They, they, they avoid it. They don't do it. They're not assembling themselves together with other believers. They've forsaken it as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day of approaching. Talking about the day of the Lord. Talking about the day when, when Christ is going to come back, when we go through all that tribulation. As you see that day approaching, it's so much more important that we don't forsake the assembling, that we get into church, that we're here to, to be able to provoke one another unto love and to good works. It is important. So people will say, you know, I don't need church. Well, the Bible says right here that we ought not to forsake the assembling ourselves together. And then it goes on. Just so you know, I mean, this is, this is a sin. Not going to church is a sin. You see it right here, not forsaking ourselves together. But let's keep reading. Because it doesn't just end there. Verse 26 says, for. That's, conjunct, that's a conjunction of what he just said, for. So because of this, because of the, the people not assembling themselves together, he says, for if we sin willfully 
After that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He's saying, look, if you're sinning willfully and, and keeping yourself out of church, there's no more sacrifice for sins. And he's comparing this again in Hebrews, comparing this with the Old Testament. They, they, when people would sin, if, we were to sin, if I were to sin in the Old Testament, um, just sin against God, you know, I'm say, I was saved by faith. Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So a saved person in the Old Testament, though, let's say they commit some kind of a sin. They did wrong to somebody or they did wrong against God. How would they get right with God? Well, they would bring a sacrifice. They would bring a sin offering. There would be a sacrifice for their sins. And that was their way of getting right with God. And what he's saying here is that, look, Jesus, when Jesus Christ came, he did away with all the sacrifices. When you sin now, you don't, you don't have that, that same way of getting right with God. Now, we need to confess and forsake our sins. We need to forgive others that God will forgive us. You know, that's, that's our way of getting right with God these days. But he's saying here, look, there's no more sacrifice for sin. And he says, if you sin willfully, you know you're doing wrong. You know you're supposed to go to church and you just don't go. He says, there's no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking of judgment and fire and indignation. And that's not talking about hell, my friends. It's not saying God's going to send you to hell if you don't go to church. But what he's saying, God will judge you. God will judge us in this earth as his children. He'll, he'll punish us. He'll discipline us. He'll chastise us. And we ought to have that fear of God that, that if we just willfully, defiantly do against what he has for us to do, he will punish us. And we ought to be afraid of that. The same way my children should be afraid of me, that if they're just going to, they know I said something, they know, they know that they're not supposed to do whatever it is, they know it's wrong, and they decide willfully, you know what, I'm just going to do it anyways. Well, they ought to be afraid of a punishment when they, when, when they go against dad's rules like that. And we ought to, it's the same exact way with us. Going to church is important. Don't, don't ever let, let this world or let the, this this liberal philosophy of people thinking they don't need church. I've got a relationship with God. You know, don't let that fool you. Church is important. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 5. Just to show you again another place of how important church is, we're going to see in Ephesians chapter 5 where the, the relationship between a husband and wife is likened unto Christ's relationship with the church. Okay, and we're going to see this in Ephesians chapter 5. And this, this should help, you know, we, we learn truths about both. We can learn truths about a, a marriage, a husband and wife, and about Christ and the church when, when he's starting to compare these two relationships in Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse number 22. And I'm not going to get into the whole husband-wife thing as much. I want to I focus more on the church aspect of this passage. But in Ephesians 5, verse 22, the Bible reads, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So here we start off with this, with this, now, with this relationship. The husband's in charge at home. He's the head of the wife. He's the one that makes the decisions and, and, and decides things, just as Christ is the head of the church. So when we come to church, Christ is the one that makes all the rules. He's the one that we follow. He's the one that, that we're getting our direction from. It's from Christ. He's the head of this church. Verse 24, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, again, the church, we, the ch and look at, this is talking about the church over and over again. We're going to see the church, the church, the church. This isn't you just staying at home. This is being in church. This is how important the church is. He's, he's outlining here, look, Christ is the head of the church. The church is subject unto Christ. He says, the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their husbands in everything. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Right here, this is saying that Christ died. He gave himself for the church. If Christ died, now obviously, yes, he died for your sins to save your soul individually. But it also says right here that he gave himself for the church, for all the, for, for all the believers, for everybody, which is true. And this should alone should tell you how important church is. If Christ gave himself for something called the church, shouldn't you be there? Is that something that you should just say, I don't need church. 
Christ died for the church, and you think you don't need church? You think you just stay home and you can watch the TV and, and watch some preacher on TV and you call that church? That's not church. That's not the meaning of church. It's not just to get some teaching from a man. You could read a book. You could read the Bible. But that's not church. You need to have church. Christ gave himself for it. We see here. Let's keep reading. He says in verse 26, why? He said, in verse 26 says, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. One of the main reasons for coming to church is because you're going to hear God's word preach and it should be like a washing water, washing water of the, wood, of the word that you can help to clean up your life so that you can be holy and blameless and present yourself to God as, as without spot, without wrinkle because you're hearing his word preached and you're getting exhorted by other people in the church and you're cleaning up your life and you're, and you're, you're getting sin out of your life. This is one of the main reasons for coming to church. And, and this is why church is so important. You can't just get this all on your own. You can't just get this sitting at home or watching TV or, or listening to a sermon on the internet. You have to be in church to get this. And this is why it's so important. Let's just finish off the chapter here. He says in verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. The Lord loves the church. You need to be in church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Ought to way too often... People use that, use these phrases, and, and they, they use it to justify why they don't need church. And it's just, a lot of it's their own ignorance of what the Bible even says. They hear something said by someone else, and they say, oh, that sounds good. Oh, that's in the Bible. Okay, great. Now I'm just going to cling to that. The same way people like to cling to these specific verses to try to justify them drinking alcohol. They try to justify some other sin in their life. So they'll take one verse out of context and, and ignore the rest of Scripture. Just ignore what the Bible's saying as a whole. They'll cling to one little verse and try to say that this means that my sin is okay. And they do that with that one, the verse that we, that we just read in Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered together in my name, they're in my midst. Well, see, look, I don't need to go to church because Christ is here. Christ is here right now. We're talking. This is church. I've had people tell me that before. I've had someone say, you and I talking about Jesus, this is church right now. So, no, it's not church. We're having a conversation about God. That's great. There's nothing wrong with that. And, it, and sure, Jesus Christ could be here in the midst of us, but it does, doesn't make it church. I have Jesus in my heart. Every day I walk around on the street by myself, Jesus is with me. That doesn't mean I'm in church 24-7, <laughs> right? That's, that's ridiculous. People also say this. They'll say, I don't have a religion. I have a relationship. So we're, we're going to get into having a good relationship in a minute, but I want to cover some of these phrases because, for one, they're a little irritating, but for two, think about the things that people say. Don't get caught up in this because... It's easy for this stuff to spread, and it spreads like wildfire. It just it sounds catchy and, and good, and people cling to it. I don't have a religion. I have a relationship. And I'll tell you what, actually, I have both. And if you're saved, you should have both too. Now, one, again, our relationship starts with us being saved. Hey, if you're a son, you already have that relationship. But we ought to have a religion too. Turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, if you're still in Hebrews... James is just the next, next book over. Just a, should be a couple pages from where we were in Hebrews. James chapter 1. Oh, I guess we were in Ephesians 5. Sorry. My, my Bible is still open to, James, to Hebrews. <clears throat> James chapter 1. Look at verse number 26. And unfortunately, the, the reason why this, these phrases get popularity is because there's a little bit of truth to them, because there's, there's something people can identify with. They say, oh, I don't have a religion. I have a relationship. And it's become so popular because there's so many churches these days that teach for doctrine the commandment of men. They teach that 
you know, basically their own opinions and they're not just preaching God's word and teaching what the Bible says. They're just making up a bunch of stuff. So it's a vain type of a religion. And, and you have a bunch of religions out there that I'll teach you. You have to you know, say all these Hail Marys and you have to bow down. You have to worship this idol. You have to do all these different things. You have to jump through these hoops to get saved. And you have all this stuff that's not in the Bible. So it becomes this, this tradition of man way more than, <clears throat> than a true religion. But look at what it says in verse 26 of James chapter 1, right at the end of the chapter. He says, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. So this is talking about the wrong type of religion, right? And, and if you use this statement, I don't have a religion, I have a relationship, people like that phrase because they're used to the wrong religion, the wrong type of religion where, where <clears throat> you have a lot of hypocrites and you have hypocrisy by the pastors and the preachers and they're, they're saying one thing but then they're not even able to bridle their own tongue. They can't even control what they're saying and they deceive their own hearts. Hey, that, that religion is vain. Should we avoid that religion? Yes. That religion is vain. But look at verse number 27. It doesn't stop there. He says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. So he's saying, look, there is a pure religion before God. God identifies with a pure religion. The word religion is not bad. It's not a bad word, which today it's almost like a cuss word. People say, oh yeah, I don't have a religion. I have a relationship. And they say, oh yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't have that religion stuff. Well, the Bible says right here, pure religion and undefiled is this. Now let's look at it. And I think this is a big reason why so many people will say they don't have a religion. They have a relationship. It says it's this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So you know what a lot of people that say, I don't have a religion, I have a relationship, they're, they're telling the truth because they don't have a pure religion because they're not going out and doing the work of visiting the fatherless, visiting the widows, and keeping themselves unspotted from the world. And, and you know, caring about God's word and reading the commandments and trying to get the sin out of their life. You're not going to be able to do that when you're not, you're not in church, you're not reading your Bible. Yeah, you, ha you claim to have this relationship. It's just a cop-out of saying, well, I have a relationship because I have a fuzzy feeling in my heart when I listen to my Christian music and that's my relationship with God. Yeah. And it's a, it's a fake Christianity that we have today. And people are deceived and you have these little catchphrases that, that get popularity of, uh, that people just repeat like a parrot without even thinking about them. And if you just read your Bible, you can see, look, there is pure religion. And you ought to have that religion because that religion's doing good on others. It's, it's helping to follow this, the widows, and keeping yourself free from sin. That is a pure religion. That is what God identifies with. And a lot of people will say, I don't like that religion. And they don't like it because they say, well, there's a bunch of rules. Yeah, they're, God, they're called God's commandments, and that's how we keep ourselves unspotted from the world, by obeying God's commandments. And that's one of the re main reasons why people say, well, I don't, I don't want that religion. I don't want a religion. I just want a relationship. Well, you're not going to have a very good relationship if you don't have the religion. But let's get more into this, uh, to how we can have a good relationship. Now that we covered some of those popular catchphrases. I think most people who use that, that phrase of having a relationship with Jesus, they don't even realize that they actually don't have a good relationship with him. Now, they might be saved. They might have that relationship of being a son, right? But we really do need to have, it is important to have a good relationship with God, with our Father. We, we ought to be striving for that. We want to have this good relationship. Now, obviously, the most important relationship, as I mentioned earlier, is are you a son? We saw that in Matthew 18. 1 John 5, 1 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. So that's the first aspect of having a relationship. But now, what about this? Are you loved of God? Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, and then we're going to be turning to John 15 next if you want to get that ready. First John 5, 3. 
tells us, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. So, in a relationship, there should be love, right? You say, well, in, in, in a, whether it's a family or, or husband, wife, whatever, whatever that is, whatever your relationship is, you should have love there, and, and it should be both ways, right? You should, if it's, a, we're talking about the relationship between us and Jesus, we say, well, I love Jesus, and I want Jesus to love me, right? I want God to love me, and I want to love Jesus. Well, in order to have that good relationship where, where we really have that love going back and forth, 1 John 5, 3 says, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. His commandments are not grievous. They're not, they're not some horrible thing for us to follow. But He says, this is the love of God. We need to keep His commandments. Turn to John 15. Now, we've covered this a little bit in our, in our series on John a few weeks ago, in John 15. But we'll, we'll just cover it again in, in light of what we're preaching about this morning. John 15, look at verse number 10. And this was Jesus Christ speaking. We want to have a good relationship with Jesus Christ. Look what He says in verse 10. He says, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Again, we want to have a good relationship. We want, to have, we want Jesus to have a, a loving relationship with us. He says, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Jesus was sinless. He was perfect. He kept all of his Father's commandments. And he abided in God's love. If we want to abide in the love of Jesus Christ, we need to be keeping his commandments. That's what it says right here, flat out. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. You have a good relationship with someone. You have love going back and forth. Of course it's going to make you happy. You're going to have joy. And what we see here that in order to have that great relationship, in order to have that joy, we need to be obeying his commandments. We need to be listening to what he has to say. We'll jump down to verse 14. A good relationship. Wouldn't, wouldn't you consider, if you could consider Jesus Christ your friend? Hey, that's a pretty good relationship, right? So people that say, oh no, I've got a relationship. I don't have a religion. I'm just going to sit at home. I don't need to go to church. And they, they think they have this great relationship with God. Well, would they consider Jesus their friend? They'd probably say, yeah. Well, look at what it says in verse 14. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Again, you can't escape the, the keeping the commandments of having that re loving relationship with God, with Jesus Christ, having that good relationship. We need to listen to Him. We need to obey Him in order to have that, that good relationship. And it's going to bring us joy. It will be a great relationship. So what else can we do to make sure we have a good relationship with God? And actually a, a personal relationship with God, right? Well, we need to communicate. As in any relationship, there needs to be communication going back and forth. We need to speak to Him. We're His children. He will hear us, but He wants us to speak to Him. The same way that, that I want my, my children communicating with me. You know, we're going to have a good relationship the more we're able to communicate with each other and talk about things that are going on in their head, in their life, whatever it may be, we need to have that communication open. Well, that'll help us to have a good relationship. Part of the good relationship is going to be, they need to be just listening and obeying me. right? I've got rules, and if they want to have a good relationship with me, they ought to listen to those rules and follow them and respect me and, and, and obey them. But that's not all. They, we also need to have that communication going back and forth. I need, they need to not just obey, but they need to learn. They need to grow. They need to understand more. And that's going to come through that communication. We need to pray to God. That is our communication to Him. We speak to God through prayer. We bring our problems to Him. God, I'm struggling here. Can you please help me with this? Now, if we're already obeying His commandments, listening to what He's got for us to do, and, and, and doing that, he's gonna, His ears are going to be wide open to our prayers. and he Because we're going to have that good relationship. He's going to love us. And I don't mean that. Look, when I say love, I just want to clear this up real quick. There's a love that never goes away when you get saved as His child. That love can never be separated from you. That will never go away, okay? And again, it's the same thing with my own children. I love them no matter what. But I'm talking about the, I guess you call it the extra love, right? The love of, of, of having that good relationship 
or just being that much closer together, having a great relationship in that way. So this is the love that comes from, from the obedience, from the listening and everything else. There's, it, it's, it's a greater love. It's a deeper love. It's more than just the, you're my child. It's, 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 I'm pleased with you. Everything's going great. And we have a good relationship. So uh, I just wanted to make that clear. Obviously, we can never be complete. Even if you just broke all of God's rules, if you're a son, he has that, that particular love for you of, of a son, of a child that will never, ever go away. You can never be removed from that love. But you probably want that love to be as great as possible, as big as possible. And this is how we do is by obeying him. But um, so we need to pray to him. We need to go to him in, in, in prayer. Now, probably even more important to, than, than communicating with him, because I think a lot of people try to do that. Even more important is we need to listen. Especially if you're going to him in prayer, we need to be listening. If you want to get a response from God, you better be listening to what he has for you. And he's not going to audibly speak in your ear. When you pray to God, you're not going to have a little voice come in your ear and, and tell you like, I'm going to answer your prayer in 10 days. And this, you know, <laughs> it's not going to happen. It doesn't work that way. He's already given you, uh, he's already given you all the answers to the questions that you could have and all the answers to your prayers that you need. It's all here. They already are here. It doesn't mean don't go to them anymore, but this is where we're going to hear back from God. And, and he can speak to us. He does speak to us through his word. These are his words. This is the word of God. He's speaking to us, but we need to listen, which is why it's so important to read your Bibles daily. We need to have that communication where we're talking to him and we're listening to what he has for us to do. I can't emphasize that fact enough. Now, if we're supposed to keep his commandments in order to keep that good and loving relationship, how can we, if we don't even know what those commandments are because we're not reading, because we're not listening to what he has to say? We need to be listening in order, in order to, to understand what those commandments are. Now, think about this. I, I, I got an, an illustration here. Imagine I'm telling my daughter to do something very important, extremely important task, and I need her to do this. But she's playing on the iPod, you know, she's distracted, she's just kind of, yeah, not really listening to what I have to say, right? But I'm giving her an important commandment. I'm telling her, look, you need to listen. This is really important. But she just keeps ignoring me. So I tell her what, you know, what she needs to do. And she ends up not doing it because she wasn't listening. She wasn't fully given, given the proper attention that she should have been given. So she doesn't do what I asked her to do. Is that going to help our relationship? Not a bit. No, absolutely not. When, when she's just, just she, she didn't do it. Now think about this. What if the thing I was asking her to do would have saved a person's life, but because she didn't do it, the person ended up dying and had horrible consequences? Think about that. She wasn't listening. And the, and the one thing I told her to do, and I said, you need to do this. This is, this is really important. But wasn't listening, wasn't paying attention. Someone lost their life because of that. What's that going to do for our relationship? It's not going to be good. But look, God has told us to do things that in many cases will have an eternal impact on people's lives. It could literally save a person's soul. And one of those things, one of those commandments is going out and preaching the gospel to every creature. This is something that he's told us to do. Now, we don't know, we don't, we don't see our whole path laid out before us right now. But God has a path for you. God has work for you to do. And he tells you to do these things. And, and the things that we need to do, it's not really much different for anybody. We, they're all, it's all written here. Okay. If we're listening, we can listen to God, pay attention to him. Don't be distracted with all these other flashing lights and sounds and games and everything else that could distract us in this life, whatever that may be. We need to, to take the time and, and listen and focus. Put some time aside in your life to listen to God, to read your Bible, and not just to listen, but to do what He has for you to do. Because there are some very important things that He has for you. It's not just... It's, 
everything that he has for us in our life is important. If it wasn't important, he wouldn't have it for us to do. We need to listen and we need to understand that, that when we're not doing what he asks us to do, there's going to be consequences, and oftentimes the consequences are for other people. It's a result of our inaction. And we want to have the best relationship possible for Jesus Christ. We need to be listening to him. I'm all for having a great personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I, think it's, I do think it's very important. So I, again, that, that phrase, I don't have a problem with that phrase in particular. I, you know, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I think that's great. I just think that a lot of people who are using that phrase, they don't have a great relationship with Him because they're not listening to Him. Because they're not in church. Because they're not hearing what they need to be hearing, they need the, the truth from God's Word. Let's use the Bible to help us understand how to have that relationship. And especially, you know, let's not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Church is important. We need, we need it even more. The, the la I believe the last days are upon us. And I mean, we've already come 2,000 years since, the, since these words have been revealed about the end times in the New Testament and, and, and all of these commandments and all these things for us to do in the New Testament. And we are 2,000 years closer to the to that end time. And he says, you know, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but so much the more as you see the day approaching. So much the more. We need church. We need Jesus. We need to have that good relationship with God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for being our Father, for, for giving us a love, dear Lord, that we know can never, can never go away, the love of a father to his children. God, I pray that you would please just... Um, Help us to improve our relationship with you. Help us to, um, to get the sin out of our life, to, to obey your commandments, to, to come to you in prayer when we have needs. And also, dear Lord, I pray that you please help us to listen and to do that which is right, dear God, to, to listen to what you have for us to, to, to know and um, to put your words into practice that we could have a good, joyful, loving relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.